I'd love for you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to close our time this weekend in only one passage. lost my eyes. Where did they go? Ah, can't see them without these. All right. <laughs> I want you to imagine for a moment a typical day. You wake up, you get your coffee, you pick out your shoes, your clothes, you make your plans for the day. You're going to spend time with friends, you're going to go to work, you've got projects around the house. And when you get to where you're going, a message arrives. And the message simply states that you have been declared a citizen of a country that you've never heard of. You quickly do a Google search, you do your research, you start looking into this country, you discover that it is an idyllic place, perfect weather, beautiful topography, mountains, oceans, no humidity, no mosquitoes, no mayonnaise. I keep bringing that up. I need to stop that. <laughs> there is peace in this country. The country does not have enemies that can threaten it, and it has peace within. The behavior and activities of its citizens are well regulated. Everybody loves living there, but they have a very strict immigration policy. No immigration. You can't get in. The only people allowed to live there are those who are born there. And the more you do your research, the more you discover that the best part of this beautiful land is its government. It has a dictatorial monarch and his word rules. But the more you discover about this king, you find that he is like no other. He is an absolute monarch, but his is a governance of kindness toward all of his subjects, whom he knows personally. And he wants to bring you there. He wants to make you a citizen. This, of course, would change the way you drink your coffee. This would change the way you go about your business and make your friends and raise your kids and plan a career and recreate. This changes everything. And Christian, what I have just described to you is no tall tale. It is actually your story. This is precisely what has happened to you. Leave out the Google and the mosquitoes. I want to turn your attention to Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. This will be the focus of our time this morning. And Paul writes here, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. Let's pray together. O oh God, our King, our Redeemer, You who have called us Your friends, we praise You for these words we set our eyes on here this morning these truths which transcend our circumstances, our experiences here, and yet are more real, more true, more enduring than anything we could experience or feel here. God, help us to grasp these things by faith and cling to them with a white-knuckle grip of trust in you over time. As we wait for your appearing, as we wait for our home going, May these truths resonate in our hearts and regulate our lives here so that we are prepared and so that we are investing 
in our future citizenship. And we ask it for your glory and our good in Jesus' name. Amen. What we're going to look at this morning are three reminders that radically affect everyday life. This is where a theology of heaven, of all the things we've looked at this week, comes down to everyday life. These three reminders ought to change the way we live. We need to understand the context of this passage. Notice that in verse 20, Paul begins his statement about our citizenship in heaven with a little subordinating conjunction, the word for. And that tells us to look up. This is predicated on things that are said prior to this passage. Paul is giving a reason for something in declaring that our citizenship is in heaven. And we need to go back to verse 17 to discover what he's getting at. He says, their brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things." The heading for this whole section is Paul's injunction to follow Paul. Paul says, follow me, follow my example. Uh, we'll discover exactly what he has in mind with that example. But he extends the example beyond himself. He says, also, uh, follow those who, who also walk according to the pattern you have in us. So, follow men like Paul, follow those who live like Paul and walk like Paul according to the pattern that Paul is going to describe. And we discover what Paul has in mind when we see the contrast of other people to not follow. Verse 18, follow me, says Paul, and follow the people that walk in our example, says Paul, for many walk whom I've told you about and don't follow those guys. In verse 18, this contrast is critical because it sets up a difference in perspective between those who live for temporal things and those whose citizenship is in heaven, who live for eternal things. And notice what he says about them. Uh, don't follow these. I've often told you about them, verse 18, and I now tell you even weeping. Whatever these guys are doing brings Paul sorrow. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. Enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, I don't believe Paul here is describing people outside the church. Everybody outside the church is a, an enemy of God, a, a set against the cross of Christ. But the reason Paul is weeping and the reason Paul is telling the Philippian believers don't follow their example is because there are those who are professing Christ who have made themselves out to be the enemies. And notice what Paul says, of the cross of Christ. What is it to be an enemy of the cross of Christ? Well, the cross is an emblem of suffering. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you have to take up your cross and follow me. I believe the people that Paul is talking about here are the prosperity Christians of his day. The ones who said, hey, you can have Christ and the world. You can have heaven and your best life now. These are the ones who said, listen, you, you can live the way you want to live and your sins are forgiven and you'll be okay in heaven. You, you, get out of, you get a get out of jail free card and you get to live the way you want. And notice how Paul describes them in verse 19. Their end is destruction. You see, a person who names the name of Christ but lives for this world is not a true Christian. It's not a genuine believer. Their citizenship is not in heaven. To be an enemy of the cross of Christ, to actually say to Jesus, Jesus, I know you said that following you meant taking up my cross daily, but you know what? I don't like crosses. <laughs> I don't like suffering. I don't like doing hard things that are gonna cost me. I don't like living for another world because that means I don't get to have a white knuckle grip on the things of this world and I really like this stuff. And they become an enemy of the cross of Christ. And Paul says their end is destruction. And then he talks about their worship. He says their God is their appetite. Whatever I'm hungry for right now, that's what I go get. No regulation of the life for eternal things. No curbing of fleshly appetites. It's there, I want it, I'm just going to go get it. 
It is ultimately the religion of the worship of self. My God is my appetite. Whatever I want, I just go get it. Not living for another world, not governed by the patterns of heaven, by the priorities of heaven, by the passions of heaven, but governed by me. Uh, Burger King said I could have it my way, and by golly, I'm going to have it my way. Uh, Nike said, just do it, and I'm going to just do it. You, this is the pattern of the world. Self-absorption, self-consumption, worship of me. Their God is their appetite. Notice he also says their glory is in their shame. We've been talking about glory this weekend. We will enter into our eternal glory. We will be in the presence of God's glory and the glory of God, the weighty brilliance of God's glory emanating out through the people of God and the architecture of the city of God and the new Jerusalem. But what is the glory here for these false professors of Christ? Shameful things. Shameful things. Now, does this mean that, that these believers are walking around talking about the things that they can do? Hey, listen, I can have Jesus, and listen, I can have the world too. And they're actually boasting in what they might consider liberties that are actually self-destructive behaviors that harm not only themselves, but also the church. And I believe haunting the church at Philippi and haunting a lot of the churches during the New Testament era are the same kinds of things that infect and infiltrate the church of Jesus Christ today. People that, people that say, that say hey, sin is not that bad. I can have what I want, and I can hold on to Jesus. To Jesus. And Paul says and Paul such, says such is not the case. And the end of that, that is, is destruction. destruction. Because, because they're glorying, glorying not, not in the glorious, glorious God, God of the universe, not in their, in their Redeemer, Redeemer, but actually, but actually in sin. In sin. sin. A road to apostasy that leads to destruction. And that's their that's boast. Their boast. That's, their that's their glory. glory. That's what they brag that's about. That's what they love. they love. And notice the, and last, the last description, description of them in verse 19. Verse 19. They, they set, set their minds their on earthly things. things. Right. Contrary to what we read the, at the beginning of our first session, Colossians 3, set your mind on things above. Here the contrast is they set their minds on earthly things. Get your best life now. Paul says, don't be like them. They have absorbed a, a worldly carpe diem, right? Seize the day. Not seize the day now for things that don't rust and can't be stolen and can't be eaten by moths, but seize the day now. Get it while you can. He who dies with the most toys wins, right? Uh, this is what they live for. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow will die. Get it all now. Uh, they've actually flipped Philippians 1.21. Paul says there, to live as Christ... And to die is gain. It means my life here now is service to Christ my Savior and for the things he's interested in. And to die is gain. They flipped it around. Oh yeah, to die, that'll be Christ. I'll get Christ. But for now, now is gain. I'm going to live now and gain. And in the end, I still get Jesus. Well, you can't have both. Um, what does the Bible say? He who is friends with the world has made himself what? At enmity with God. An enemy of God. It's hostility towards God to embrace these things, to glory in these things, to make your appetite about these things. And Paul says, for our citizenship, and here's the contrast. <laughs> the reason Paul says, follow me and follow the other believers who are walking in the pattern that, I, that we're walking in. Don't follow those guys. Why? Because our citizenship is in heaven and this brings us to our first reminder this morning. Heaven is home. We belong to heaven. The, the first reminder that ought to affect everyday life for us is that we belong to heaven. We are owned by heaven. We are citizens of heaven. Paul says in verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. This word citizenship would have been very precious to people that lived in Philippi. It would have had a, a double meaning for believers in Philippi. Citizenship uh, it was significant. In 49 BC, all Italians were declared Roman citizens. But by 47 AD, that's about 100 years later, only 9% of residents of the Roman Empire were actually Roman citizens. And, and you could be born a Roman citizen if you were in the right city, 
if you were in the right family, or you could purchase Roman citizenship if you had enough money, or you could earn Roman citizenship by putting your life on the line in significant ways in military service. And sometimes the Roman Empire would confer citizenship on a colony or a city far removed from itself. Um, Philippi was such a city. Philippi was a city 600 miles away from Rome on the Aegean Sea that was populated by war veterans that had defended the Roman Empire, most of whom had never been to Rome, had never seen Rome, but had been colonized in this new city of Philippi. And so they built Philippi as a little Rome. It was actually called Little Rome. And its architecture resembled Rome, its jurisprudence was Roman, its governance was Roman, its culture was Roman, everything about it was Roman, and the city itself was granted citizenship status. So if you were born in Philippi, if you were one of the army veterans in Philippi, you were given Roman citizenship. And so the the citizens of Philippi were registered citizens of a place they had never been. And the only place they had ever known Um, was not where their citizenship was from. For believers in the church at Philippi, for Paul to say, our citizenship is in heaven, is to say, you are a registered citizen of a place you've never been, and your home, the place you belong, is not here. The only place you've ever known is not where you belong. It's not our home. Citizenship for people in Philippi was more than a status. It was a way of life. The the flavors of Rome, the the governance of Rome, the priorities of Rome flavored the city. And, And likewise for Christians, heaven flavors our life here. Heaven's priorities, heaven's passions, heaven's desires. These are the things that govern our life. They are our rule of life, our governance. And notice how Paul says this. Our citizenship is in heaven. Present tense, not future. He doesn't say, hey, your citizenship will be in heaven when you get there. Walk through the pearly gate and you're good. No, you're a citizen of heaven now. This is similar to what Paul says in Ephesians 2. We, we have already been seated in the heavenlies, or Colossians 1.13. We already have been transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. These are present realities. You see, Christianity is not just a different way to live. Oh, I live this way or I live that way or I'm going to pick the the way of life called Christianity. Um, No, it's a totally new identity because you belong to another realm. Your morality, your set-apartedness is in keeping with your identity as a citizen of heaven. Are you homesick? for your permanent residence? Is your life increasingly governed by the priorities and passions of heaven? It may be that you have never yet experienced a change of citizenship. If you don't find in your life a longing to be home and an increase in the governance of your life by the priorities that are marked by that home, then it could be that you are not yet a citizen of heaven. You only get in by birth or by blood, right? We get in by new birth and the blood of Jesus Christ. There's a second reality that governs everyday life for us that changes the way we get our coffee and pick out our clothes and put on our shoes and make our friends and go about our business. It is this, we wait for Jesus. We wait for Jesus. Notice what Paul says in verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We eagerly await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Salvation can be spoken of in your New Testament as past, present, and future. We have been saved. We are in the process of being saved, and there is a future salvation yet to come. That's not to say that anybody who has been saved, justified, is in jeopardy, right? What God begins, he finishes. But our salvation can be seen from different vantage points. Um, Our salvation has not culminated yet in its final reality. And we are in the process of being saved. We have been saved, and we will be saved. This is why Paul can say here in Philippians 3.20, we eagerly await a Savior, Wait, I thought I was already saved. Yes, we can't wait for our Savior to come back. 
(laughs) and complete what he has begun. And Paul calls him here the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, he is the Lord. He's sovereign over everything and he's in charge of my life. And he's Jesus, the baby born in Bethlehem. He is the one who lived a perfect life on this earth and was crucified on a cross. And he is the Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is his title. He's Messiah. Right? He is the Lord Jesus, the Christ. And we await him in eager expectation. This word for uh, eagerly waiting is used eight times in the New Testament. And every single time, it is looking forward to eschatology, the end times. It is looking forward to the return of Christ and the vindication of our Savior and God setting everything right. And this Lord Jesus Christ, we eagerly await for his coming from heaven, from heaven. And heaven is home, we've talked about it this weekend, because Jesus is there. Heaven is home because God is there. He is the focus. He is what makes it home. This waiting for uh, Jesus is not an idle waiting. This is not a sitting around twiddling our thumbs, wondering what to do. Um, In fact, this is an active, eager waiting. I remember my dad would say often, "Um, could it be today, son? I remember flying remote control airplanes or uh, being out a lake and and seeing a thundercloud roll in over a lake and and dad would look up and he'd say, could it be today? And and everybody else would say, could it be today what? (laughs) When Jesus comes back. And, and my dad was um, not static. He was uh, moving about all the time, busy all the time, doing all kinds of things. His waiting for Jesus was an eager expectation filled with a lifetime of activity for God's glory. But that question, could it be today, has been emblazoned in my memory. Waiting for Jesus defines a Christian. Are you looking up in eager anticipation? All of this changes how we live our lives here. Eager waiting is anticipation and obedience and longing and faith. Faith multiplied by time. This changes the way we eat our cornflakes in the morning and get our coffee and hang out with friends and go to work and choose a career and raise our kids. This changes good days and bad days. We talked about this last night. A really enjoyable day is a preminder of what is to come. And a difficult day is a reminder that this isn't my home. My citizenship is in heaven. There's a third reminder we need to have this morning from Philippians 3. It's in verse 21. It is simply this, we will be changed. We will be changed. We belong to heaven, we wait for Jesus, and we will be changed. And and Jesus is the one who changes us. The Lord Jesus Christ, verse 21, will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. You see, you can't go home in the state you are in right now. You must be changed. None of us naturally was qualified to be a citizen of heaven. To be a citizen in God's glorious city. Where nothing impure is allowed in. Two fundamental changes must happen. The first is new birth. And the second is a resurrection body fit for glory. And notice what has to happen. The the body of our humble state or the body of our humiliation must be brought into the conformity of the body of Jesus' glory. Your home country is not a realm you can enter in your natural state. (laughs) The first transformation that has to happen is the gospel's invasion into your life. And I want you to think about how God has accomplished this for people whose citizenship was the wrong kind. All of us fall into that category of verse 19. We were enemies of the cross of Christ. Our end was destruction. Our appetites were our God. 
we gloried in what was shameful and we had our minds set on earthly things. That was our life. When I was a kid, I had an ant farm. Anybody have an ant farm? Okay. Um, moms typically get nervous about ant farms. <laughs> hey, where all the ants go? Yeah. I don't know, mom. <laughs> you know, the, you, you get this plexiglass little box and it's two pieces of plexiglass, you know, kind of thin together. Um, room enough for the width of an ant to be in there and the sand is inside and the uh, ants dig their intricate little tunnels and, and they're crawling about doing their ant things. And Imagine if you had an ant farm and, and your task every day was to, with a little eyedropper, give them water and, 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 and to give them their food. Uh, what was prescribed for my little ant farm was Kellogg's Special K cereal. They seemed to really like that. They perked up with Special K. <laughs> And your job every day is to make sure the ants have what they need. And, and they're digging their tunnels. And, and maybe one day you, you look in the ant farm and you see one of the ants upside down with his antenna broken. Do they have antenna? Yeah, I think they have antenna. <laughs> the antenna broken and, and he's not moving. I think, well, what happened to this ant? And so you pluck his little body out of the ant farm and you put it somewhere. <laughs> and the next day you come back and there's three more ants with mangled cephalothorax or whatever they have. You think, what is going on? And, and you look closely and, and the ants are fighting with each other, mangling each other, killing each other, stealing food from each other, burying each other in their tunnels. I think, what has gone on with these ants? They're crazy. And, you know, you and I would just <laughs> order some new ants. <laughs> but what if you could just talk to them? Hey, ants, hey, stop it. Can't we all just get along? You know, give him a Rodney King speech. <laughs> just love each other. They wouldn't understand. And, and so you, 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 fat fingers go down in there and give them their food and, and they bite you. Well, no, 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 don't, don't you understand? I, I'm trying to take care of you. I want to help you. I give you what you need every day and... And, and, and you hate me. And what if you could go down in there? Maybe take on ant form, form and, and crawl around in their tunnels and talk ant talk and eat ant food. and That'd be creepy. <laughs> and, and, and those ants, they, they don't understand you. They don't know who you really are. They just think you're some other ant to mistreat. And they don't listen to what you say, even though you're saying the wisest ant things that have ever been said. <laughs> and, and you're fixing broken antenna and even some of those dead, mangled ants you caused to breathe again. I mean, you know where the story's going. <laughs> and what do the ants do to you? Pull off your antenna bury you in the sand, beat you up, spit on you, mock you, make fun of you. Who are you? What are you talking about? I'll kill you. What God has done for us in taking on flesh and dwelling among us is infinitely more shocking than the silly story I just made up. And what was it like for God to take on human flesh and dwell among us and endure us? I mean, he, he made friends. <laughs> Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus and John and, and these knuckle-headed disciples that followed him around everywhere. He, he cared for them, loved them, patiently taught people wept over a rich young ruler who didn't want to listen to what he said. 
wept over a city of people that he had created and was sustaining by the word of his power while they mocked him and tried to murder him multiple times and finally constructed a sham trial with false witnesses and hung him on a cross. Staggering what God has done. And it's the only way that God can grant citizenship for us in heaven. To actually pay for our sin in the broken body of his son. To redeem us, to rescue us in love. He, he can't just say, oh, you can all be citizens. We're not qualified. Something has to radically change judicially and practically. Judicially, we have to be declared in the court of heaven to be perfect, to have always done everything right. And, and we're so unqualified for that declaration. It is all of God's grace to consider you as if you had never done anything wrong and as if you had always done everything right in keeping with his glory. That's his declaration in love over believers. And, and what he has us do is in faith simply trust his work. Entrust ourselves to him. Turn our lives over to him. God, yes, you can have everything I am because he has done all the work to make us citizens of heaven. The second transformation that has to happen is your glorification. You have to be declared a citizen by the gospel and then you actually have to be made fit to be there personally. You and I can't get there the way we are physically or the way we are spiritually. We're still in this mixed condition. We still have residual depravity. We still have tendencies in us to rebel against the things we love and know. Our identity is not sin, but our residual practice still is from the heart. Our affections still have wayward components. Our behaviors still are mixed up. We can't trust ourselves. And we must be transformed. We looked at this the other day in 1 Corinthians 15. What does that transformation look like? We go from uh, a physically weak body to one raised in power. A dishonorable one raised in honor and glory we go from that which falls apart to that which is imperishable. And we also are transformed from uh, that which can sin to a creature who can't sin. This is what it means to be brought into conformity to the body of His glory. That you and I will resemble the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ as far as it is possible for creatures to approximate the Creator. Specifically, the second person of the Trinity, the God man, Jesus in his resurrection body, will always be located in a physical human body that he has for eternity. He is still omnipresent. And yet he is manifestly located in a human body forever from Bethlehem on and specifically from his resurrection body on. He will always be the God man and you and I will resemble his glorious body brought into conformity with it. Now that requires a lot of power. Paul describes that power at the end of verse 21. We will be transformed in the conformity with the body of Jesus' glory by the exertion of the power that he possesses, the exertion of the power that he has to subject all things to himself. Um, what kind of power does Jesus have? He has the power to make every tongue confess and every knee bow. Everybody in the universe, uh, thrones, rulers, dominions, Satan himself, all of God's enemies, every rebel, Everything will say, Jesus is Lord. Not because they worship him and love him, but because they must and they will. The kind of power it takes to get your enemies to make that kind of confession is remarkable. I can't even get myself to do what I want to do, much less people around me. 
You and I have no power to transform our circumstances. Jesus has all power in the universe to transform every circumstance and make everyone bow the knee and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. And with that power that Jesus possesses, he will subjugate every ounce of rebellion in a believer and eradicate it completely. He will do away with every perishable element of your broken physical body here and do away with it and bring all of you into conformity with his glorious body. It's remarkable power. That day will be the vindication of Jesus. That day will also be our glorious culmination of salvation. What will it be like? It'll be glorious. I don't know about you, God has um, used several significant events in the course of my life to make me long for heaven, eagerly await Jesus' return, to cling to my citizenship, to value it. One of those events Uh, took place in college and it was the first one that I can remember thinking I want to go to heaven and I was a a first year flight student in college had just gotten my private pilot's license and uh, that's your ticket to freedom now I can take passengers uh, and a friend of mine knew a Christian singer that I listened to Um, and Uh, lines from his music were often about heaven. One particular line saying, I will call this land, speaking of America, I will call this land my country, but it's not my home. And and his music just resonated with me. And so uh, my professor's sister was a friend of his. And so I sent a letter and said, hey, um, he was coming uh, to Middle Tennessee to conduct a worship leaders weekend conference, which I was going to. I was leading worship at a Presbyterian church. And so I was invited to this weekend conference. And I said, hey, when you're in town, um, do you want to go flying over the Appalachian Mountains? By the way, if you live in Tennessee, it's Appalachia, just so you know. Uh, do you want to go flying over the Appalachian Mountains, see it from the air? I'll give you a tour. And he said, sure, I'd love to do that. So, you know, big-eyed celebrity uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I can't wait to go take this Christian singer, one of my heroes, and um, take him flying. That was the week he flipped his Jeep and was killed. So he didn't come do the conference. Um, uh, Peacock, Charlie Peacock uh, replaced him instead. Um, and uh, I remember being so shaken. I'd never met him. Uh, He had sung so often about heaven, and now he was in heaven. And I was surprised by the palette of emotions. I I didn't grieve personally because I didn't know him personally, but I felt the sadness of the loss that others would feel. Um, And I felt strangely envious. This is what he's been singing about. This is what I've been singing about as I listen to his cassette tapes. And I, I want to go to heaven. It's like I got his music for the first time. Second event was significant. And, um, Janet's mom uh, went home after a long battle with cancer in 2001. We had been married about a year, and um, we got to be with her when she breathed her last, sang her last hymn, um, and went home. And I'll never forget the experience of knowing that she was here in a deteriorating body. Um, And then there was a body, but she wasn't here. And she was home. And, And there was personal sorrow. There was personal sadness. And still the thought, can I, you know, Janet would have for years, um, I just want to call mom and ask her about a recipe. Um, I mean, picking up the phone and, oh, I'm not going to be able to talk to her. Um, she didn't get to meet uh, her grandkids. Um, would love for her to have seen Evie and Zoe. Evie's middle name, uh, no, her first name, right? Her first name is Mary Jane. <laughs> <laughs> I 
So, you know, our firstborn's named after Mary Jane Anderson. And uh, we just love to talk to her. I got to know her very briefly, um, but would love for our kids to have known her. At the same time, felt that twinge of envy. She went home. She's home. Ah, I want to go home. And you know, in September 2012, my dad was killed in a plane crash. And uh, flew back to Texas that day and sat in his office the next morning, Sunday morning, and looked at his notes. And he was going to be teaching the college kids at Countryside Bible Church. He was going to be teaching Revelation 5 and 6, the throne room of heaven and Jesus in glory. He didn't get to teach that. He got to see it. Um, and that afternoon, he was actually teaching a message on heaven at a retirement home where he faithfully preached the gospel in the afternoons. And I got to read that sermon. He didn't get to preach it, <laughs> but he got to see it. Um, sorrow and envy. Sorrow for me, sorrow for us, envy. You know, 2 Timothy 4.8 was comforting um, our 418 uh, was comforting for me in that. Um, we don't think of cancer and plane crashes as particularly safe things. But Paul's words in 2 Timothy 418 are this, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And, and Paul was beheaded by Nero. <laughs> Um, from a human perspective, that doesn't seem very safe. But Paul was confident that departing from this life and going home is a safety in the arms of God who is bringing his citizens to where they belong. And this perspective changes everything. We miss Matt. We miss Teresa sorrow for us and yet we are so <coughs> thankful that they are citizens of heaven that they see his face that they are home and I pray that this weekend produces for us that envy godly envy that produces in us an eager waiting an eager anticipation so that we live our lives with the last words of the Bible on our lips, come Lord Jesus, quickly. For us to say or to have said at a memorial service for each one of us that she has left the land of the dying and has gone safely home. That's the truth for citizens of heaven. That is what God has declared for us. That is what God has purchased for us by the blood of his son. That is what God has made for us beyond all imagining, all comprehension. It is everything we have to look forward to. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we know where our home is. We know something of what it is like because we know something of you. You are good. And you do good. We have not plumbed the depths of the delight of knowing your goodness in this life, nor in what you've revealed in your word. Um, and we will not plumb those depths for all of eternity. God, would you so rivet in our minds, in our hearts, a knowledge of heaven, a love for you, and an eager anticipation of your return, that it would fundamentally change everything we do. May we think about heaven, long for heaven, dream about heaven every day that we walk on your earth. And I pray that it would make us more useful in your hands 
useful to those around us, useful to the church, useful to the expansion of the gospel, to the ends of the earth. We ask these things for your glory in Jesus' name.